from Studio D. Welcome to Dove Point Bible Study. We're so glad you joined us. Today we're right back in the book of Genesis, chapter 31. And from our last lecture, God has told Jacob to pull up stakes and move back to his family in Canaan. So he and his family, with all their possessions, all their livestock, pull out of Laban's camp without saying goodbye to Laban. Minor problem. And three days later, Laban gets word that they've left and Laban and his men take out in hot pursuit after them and on the, by day 10, they catch up with Jacob. And Jacob unloads his grievances against Laban, which <laughs> were all true. And Laban unloads his excuses, which that's all he had. And Laban would have overtaken Jacob. Watch this. But God had visited Laban in a dream the night before he reached Jacob. And the Lord said unto Laban, in verse 29, Take thou heed that thou speak not to Jacob, either good or bad. In other words, Laban had seen the hand of God on Jacob's life. And he knew God would destroy him and his men if Laban even tried anything physical. So instead, he decides to make peace with Jacob. And that brings us to where we left off last time. Genesis chapter 31 and verse 43. And Laban answered and said unto Jacob, These daughters are my daughters, and these children are my children. And those cattle over there, those are my cattle. And all that thou seest is mine, Jacob. And what can I do this, <clears throat> this day unto these my daughters, or unto their children, which they have borne? But the hard truth of the matter is this. None of these things belong to Laban. The daughters he sold to Jacob, and the cattle he paid them off in wages. And what he's saying here is, how could you even think I would hurt one of my own, one of my own family? Laban says, what are you accusing me of, Jacob? And so the Schlickmeister strikes again, always trying to spin the table so he looks like the good guy. Have you ever met a person like this? Well, this is how Laban is. 44. Now therefore, come thou, let us make a covenant, I and thou. And let it be for a witness between me and thee. In other words, let us always remember this peace pact between you and I that we're about to make. 45. And Jacob took a stone and set it up for a pillar. 44. Now therefore, come thou, let us make a covenant, I and thou. And let it be for a witness <clears throat> between me and thee. In other words, let it always remind us, this pillar. 45. And Jacob took a stone and set it up for a pillar. And Jacob said unto his brethren, Gather stones. And they took stones and made a, a heap. And they did eat there upon the heap. In other words, here's what happened. They ate the covenant sacrifice together. Laban's and his people, and Jacob and his people, while they were sitting on this giant heap of stones. That's what they did. 47. And Laban called it Jager Shahadatha. That's a hard one. Not Mick Jagger, but Jager. <laughs> okay. Which means the heap of the testimony. All right. But Jacob called it Galid, which means witness heap. But in reality, it's really more like a boundary. You don't cross this and I don't cross there. It's a boundary between the two. And the reason they use two different words is because there are two different languages being spoken here. One in Chaldee and one is in Hebrew. The Hebrew is Galid. 48. And Laban said, This heap is a witness between he and me this day. Therefore was the name of it called Galid, again, the witness heap. And it's called something else, 49. And Mizpah. And that means a watchtower. For he said, the Lord watch between me and thee. When we're, about, when we're absent one from another, in other words, it's a place of separation and it's an agreement that they weren't going to attack each other. That's what it boiled down to. I'm already needing a Lachine break. I got the dry mouth. If you're ready out there, let's get it. Let's get it and let's go. Are you ready? Lekaim to life.
Two of them for me. <clears throat> mm, 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 mm. So he continues, verse 50. If thou shalt afflict my daughters, <clears throat> or if thou shalt take other wives beside my daughters, no man is with us. See, God is witness betwixt me and thee. In other words, Laban said, if you do these things, I won't know about it, but God will see it. And, he, and Laban knows this now. He knows this about Jacob because he's seen God in Jacob's life. So he knows God's watching. All right? 51. And Laban said to Jacob, Behold this heap, and behold this pillar which I have cast betwixt me and thee. 52. This heap be witness, and this pal uh, pillar be witness, that I will not pass over this heap and this pillar unto me for harm. Now, I find it interesting here, if you think about this, that Laban, who was an idol worshiper, but now, when it's getting down to the real nitty gritty, we find that he wants to swear by the one true God and not his idols. Well, why is that? It's because he's watched the one true God work through Jacob and his idols didn't do diddly. Okay? So now when it's to his advantage, he wants to use the one true God. 53. Then he continued. He continues. He said, The God of Abraham, the God of Nahor, the God of their father, judge between us. That's what he says. And Jacob swore by the fear of his father Isaac. Laban swore by the one true God. Why? Because Laban had seen Jacob's walk with the Lord and it affected him. Okay? It had a, it had a resounding effect on his life. And I want to tell you something. The same is true in your own life. The way you live your life is a powerful, powerful witness for God. And don't think that it isn't because it is. And don't think people aren't watching because they are. Okay? So walk it. Walk the line with God. Verse 54. Then Jacob offered sacrifice upon the mount and called his brethren to eat bread. And they did eat and tarried all night in the mount. So what's going on here? They're saying their goodbyes. Laban and his bunch was going. These people have been together for 20 years. That's how long Laban, or that's how long Jacob was there. So they're saying their goodbyes. I'm sure there were friends on both sides. They spent all night doing the sacrifice. Probably had a little wine. I'm sure they did, and because that's the way they did things. And so, so long, pal. We'll probably never see you again. 55. And early in the morning, okay, Laban rose up and kissed his sons, and kissed his daughters, and he blessed them. And Laban departed and returned unto his place. So, what is next for old Jacob? Let's find out. Genesis 32 and verse 1, new chapter. And Jacob went on his way, and the angels of God met him. Now just think about that. He's going to meet a host of angels. And God had said early on to him, I'll be with you. And right here you can see, he certainly is with him. But ask yourself this question, why a whole host of angels? There's got to be a reason. Okay? When you're studying, look for things like that, because there is a reason for this. Verse 2, And when Jacob saw them, he said, This is God's host. A host is an army, okay? And he called the name of the place Mahanim, which means, get this, two camps. Oh, and Jacob saw two camps of angels, two armies of God, two hosts of angels coming to do what? Why are they coming to him? To assure him of his promised protection as he enters Canaan. That's why they came. Now, let me ask you a question. If you met two hosts of angels assuring your protection in whatever it is you were getting ready to go through, maybe you're afraid, maybe it's a tough situation, I don't know. But if you saw two hosts of angels assuring your protection, I mean, they manifested themselves to Him, okay? Would you have any doubt or fear? 
about entering? Is he going to have any doubt and fear about entering Canaan? Because we know what's waiting on him. His brother Esau is waiting on him. Well, uh, I don't think I would have that much fear. Not if I'd just seen two hosts of angels. But, this is Jacob we're talking about. I want you to listen real close through this whole message. Because there's a real good chance that you'll find yourself in a similar situation someday. Someplace, sometime, if you're serving God, particularly if you've got a call, you're going to run into these problems. Okay, God's going to tell us how to overcome those problems. Verse 3, And Jacob sent messengers before him to Esau, his brother, unto the land of Seir, which means hairy, okay, the country of Edom, which means red. So old hairy red, that's his place, and that's what they call the place, right? And here God loves Jacob enough, think about this, that he sent angels to guide him and to protect him. So it's obvious, God is with Jacob and he's going to continue to be with him and continue Jacob is to be blessed. But at the same time, here's the dilemma, he's headed back home and he's about to meet his brother Esau who has sworn to kill him. He's never backed off of it. So think about this. Okay? As we walk through this, if you were Jacob, and you knew God was with you, would you have taken the preparations that Jacob is about to take, and you're going to see him? So put yourself in his shoes. Okay? Because it looks like to me, I've been through it of course, it looks like to me, he went a little bit overboard. Alright? I don't, I don't know that, but it looks like that to me. But as we go through this, I want you to analyze yourself. Okay? As to what you would do in this same situation. And I want you to analyze this because if God has called you, Sooner or later, you're going to run into this similar situation as this. Keeping in mind all the help that God had sent Jacob, and you would think that he would have had no doubt or no fear in his mind as to the, as to the outcome. Anyway, that's the way it hits me. Verse 4. And Jacob commanded his messenger, saying, Thus shall you speak to my Lord. Okay, what does Lord mean here? It's not, it's not, it's not Father God. It's small, small letters, not large caps. Thus shall you say to my Lord. Lord means master. That's what it means. Master, master. Lord, Lord. Master, master. Thus shall you say unto my Lord Esau. Thy servant Jacob saith thus. I have sojourned with Laban and stayed there until now. In other words, that's where I've been hid out for 20 years. Running from you. Okay? And I have oxen and asses, flocks and men servants and women servants. And I have sent to tell my Lord that I may find grace in his sight. Now watch this. So he calls Esau my Lord or master. He calls himself a servant or a slave. So, ask yourself this question. Is he being humble? Or is he actually afraid? What do you think? Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, you're right. Verse 6. <clears throat> and the messengers returned to Jacob, saying, We come to thy brother Esau, and also he come to meet us, and 400 men with him. Yahoo! And they're soldiers. Oh boy! 400 soldiers. What does that mean, boys and girls? Well, Jacob doesn't know. Alright? But again, God sent you in to do something. You, you just might as well anticipate at least having the chance to take the shakes on the way to get to the prize. Okay? So he's getting his chance here. So, is Jacob going to take the shakes? Verse 7. Then Jacob was greatly what? Afraid and distressed. And he divided the people that was with him 
and the flocks and the herds and the camels into two bands. But why? God is with him. Why would he do this? Verse 8, And said, If Esau come to one company and smite it, if he takes it out, Right there, I mean, if God's with you, do you really think you're going to get smitten? I don't think so. But anyway, he said, if Esau comes to take one company and take them out, wipe them out, then the other company, which is left, shall what? Attack them and take them out? No, shall escape. We're going to, they can run while they're killing the rest of us. Now, that sounds mighty strange to me. When you've got two camps of angels with you, but, this is how Jacob decided he's going to handle it. Verse 9. And, <clears throat> and Jacob said, <clears throat> O God of my father. Oh, it's time to pray. Oh, we're going to pray right here. Let's take a lekaim break before we get into the pray. Are you ready? Lekaim! To life and the prayer. Here we go. Everybody knows this prayer, including myself. And Jacob said, O oh God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac, the Lord which saideth unto me, You told me, God, return unto thy country. You ever told him that one? Yeah. And to my kinfolk. And I will deal well with thee. That's what you told me, Lord. In other words, it was time to pray. And this is when most people pray. Okay? Most people pray right here. When they're what? When they're all blessed and everything's going good? Oh, no, 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 no. They're going to pray when they're afraid and they're distressed. Instead of doing what Paul uh, admonished us to do, instead of continually praying each and every day, we wait till we take the shakes. Good luck to you. Okay? Get a prayer life. Use it every single day. Verse 10, as he continues to pray. I am not worthy of the least of these mercies and of all the truth which thou hast showed unto thy servant. He's buttering up to God here. For with my staff I passed over Jordan, and now I am become two bands. Now it makes sense to me, okay, that if you that if you speak, you, it makes sense that you would split up your forces if you were really going to head into battle. You could have a frontal group, and then you could have a hind group or side group, okay? <clears throat> if you were heading into battle, splitting them up makes all kind of sense. But, he's not doing that. He's splitting them up so that one of them can run, baby, run. And what I see here, this is me talking, I see a little bit of doubt. Well, have I ever been there? Of course I've been there. That's the reason we're bringing this up. This is pretty common. Yeah, I've been there. I've been, been times when I didn't have any doubt, but there's been times I've had it. Okay? So what I see here is a little bit of doubt on old Jacob, as blessed as he is. In other words, you told me, God, come back here and just look at me now. I think I'm about to die. 400 soldiers. Have you ever been there? Have you ever been there? Oh, Lord, what's going to happen to me when I run into her face to face? Oh, God, what's going to happen to me? I'm going to go to that wedding and I'm going to run into you know who and we don't get along. What's going to happen there? And the strange thing is this. This was not consistent with Jacob's character. Not at all. Okay? And that's why I smell the doubt, all right? But, listen, listen to me. Don't ever doubt God. It's dangerous. Whenever God makes it clear, and you have decided, hey, let's go for it, whatever it is, which means you will have already done all your homework on your end, and you've already got all your ducks in a row, then you go for it with energy and with strength and with vigor. That's how you go at it. But you make sure you're ready too. God's going to tell you ahead of time, I want you to go in here. That's cool. But you've got to get ready too. Get ready, get ready, get ready. 
all right? And you know what? When you go in there with energy, strength, and vigor, you don't go with any doubts, with any ands, or any buts. If God has blessed you, listen to me, child of God, if God has blessed you with a certain thing, a certain talent, a certain knack, a certain gift, then when God makes it clear to you that something will succeed, it always does. I said it always does. Don't ever doubt it. And there's no negative that can stop you. Now, that's not to say that a giant might not come up to you in the process, okay? But even if a giant does confront you in the process, he won't stand. There's no way he's going to stand. You know why? Because God, before he even arrives, will take him out. He'll take him out. And I know what I'm talking about here. I said he'll take him out. But you've got to line up. You've got to know how to do this. You've got to know what you're doing. So Jacob did have a little doubt. Let me, ask it, let me ask it this way. Did Jacob have a little doubt? Or was he just overly cautious? You ever been overly cautious? I have. I don't know that answer right here. But I'm going to ask you. What do you think? You think he's got a little doubt here? Or do you think he's just over, overthinking it? You know, you can overthink things too. Let me ask you this. What would you do? Think about it. Verse 11. As Jacob continues to pray, Deliver me, I pray thee, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau. For I fear him, being honest, lest he will come and smite me and the mother with the children. Listen. Listen to me. Everybody gets afraid once in a while. It's just going to happen. Fear's out there. Anyone can experience fear. Okay? It's a given. But, it's what you do in that fear that counts. Okay? John Wayne said, this is the definition of courage. When you're scared, you saddle up anyway. You saddle up anyway. Verse 12, <clears throat> And thou saidest, I will surely do thee good and make thy seed as the sand of sea. So he keeps reminding God of all the promises. You said you'd be real good, you know. All my seed's going to be, there's going to be millions of people that, after me, which cannot be numbered for multitude. And this is what God told Jacob and his fathers. But sometimes, think about this. You can get a little, you can be a little bit too careful, okay? Especially if you're not aggressive in Father's Word. Let me say it again. <laughs> Sometimes you can get a little bit too careful. Especially if you're not aggressive enough in Father's Word. If you're scared, put more Word in you. If, if, if you're distressed, put more Word in you. Verse 13. And he lodged there that night. Oh, this story gets good here. I love this. It's quite an encounter. And he lodged there that night and took of that which came in his hand a present for Esau, his brother. In other words, <laughs> maybe a nice present will calm and suffice my brother. Now he's trying to figure it out. Okay, You know, maybe I can bribe him. Yeah, that'll work. Maybe that's the way to go. Here, and here's the present. It's a big one. Look at this present. 14, because you know, cattle and sheep and goats and camels, that's all cash in this economy down here. That's all cash. They, they're loaded, okay? <clears throat> 200 she-goats is part of the present, okay? And 20 he-goats, well, you put 20 he-goats with 200 she-goats, you're going to have a whole bunch of goats pretty quick, all right? 200 ewes, that's virgin sheep, uh, female sheep, and two uh, ram, and 20 rams, 15. 30 milch camels, that's not cigarettes, by the way, with their colts. What does it mean by milch? What is a milch camel? Okay, I'm going to tell you what a milch camel is. Milch camel is a female camel who's fresh and she's given milk. Milk, milch means she's got milk, okay? And, and so she's feeding with their colts. And then he gives 40 kine. 
Well, what are kine? Kine is bovine, it's cattle. If you remember from the prior lectures, they were talking about cattle, but they were really talking about goats and sheep. And I told you back then that the language was different then. Cattle meant goats, sheep, etc., etc. Okay? Now, to us, cattle mean cattle, and goats and sheep mean goats and sheep. It was different then. So 40 kind are 40 beef cattle, all right? And 10 bulls, and 20 she-asses, and 10 foals, all right? It's quite a present. And he delivered them into the hand of his servant, every drove by themselves. Now, what's a drove? You know, you ever heard of a cowboy out west called a drover? Okay, a drover is one that drives a herd, so these are herd, they're, dr they're driving herds, okay? <clears throat> and he delivered them into the hands of the servants, every drove by themselves. And he said to his servants, pass over before me and put a space between drove and drove. In other words, when you get to Esau, parade each group of animals separately before Esau. You run all the goats in, you have a little gap, you run all the sheep, you know, you make it look real big, right? But then look what he does. And then he divided the whole thing in half. In other words, I'll give Esau half of them, and then if he's still coming at me, I'll hit him with the other half, and maybe that will soften him up. So he's thinking about all kinds of ways to buy himself in. You ever been there? You know, I mean, maybe, yeah, maybe you have, maybe you haven't. 17. <clears throat> and he commanded foremost, saying, when Esau, my brother, meets you and asks you, saying, Who's art, whose art thou? Who does this belong to? <clears throat> and, whether, uh, and whether goest thou? And where are they going? And whose are these before thee? 18. Then thou shalt say, J Jacob's telling his men, this is what you're going to say if he asks, They be thy servant Jacob's. It is a present sent unto my lord Esau, and behold, also, he is behind us. All right? In other words, Jacob is way, 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 way back of the line. He's back behind all the goats and the sheep. He's behind everything. He's behind all of his wives, his kids, all of his... He's the last guy in the parade. And I don't think because I'm here, I don't think it's the drama building up to that. No, 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 I don't think so. <clears throat> Are you all right? Let's take a look on, shall we? Are you ready? All those out there, wherever you are, look on to life. <clears throat> mm -mm -mm -mm. 19. And so commanded he the second drove, and then the third drove, and all that followed the drove, saying, On this manner shall you speak unto Esau when you find him. Okay? 20. <clears throat> and say, <clears throat> say you moreover, Behold, thy servant Jacob is behind us. For he said, I will appease him with the present that goeth before me, and afterward I will see his face. Peradventure he will accept me. In other words, okay, <clears throat> maybe <clears throat> I can buy my way in. You ever done that one? <laughs> okay. Well, we're going through all of them here. Verse 21. So went the present over before him, and himself, oh yeah, watch this. Here's where it gets really good. Himself lodged that night in the company. So the presents all went ahead, and Jacob spent the night in the camp. 22. And he rose up that night, and took his two wives, and his two woman servants, and his eleven sons, and one daughter, and passed over the ford, Jabbok. Now, these names are interesting because they usually describe what they are. And this one does too. Jabbok means the emptying. And there's a stream they're crossing. So Jabbok means like a stream emptying. Which is why, and I had this conversation with a, with a close friend of mine this week, which is why you should really think about your child's name before you name them. And see what the name means. Okay? Our oldest son is named David. It means beloved. Okay? He has that kind of heart. But how many times did we call him David? Well, we kind of cut that off down to DJ. 
But when we, when we say DJ, we're saying David. Okay? Think about what you're going to name your child. Okay? If you're, if you're just now having a family. If you've already had it, you know, too late. You know what I'm saying? But it's okay. It's okay. You got Christ in your heart. Everything's good. It's, every, it's all under the blood. But I really, would, I really would give a lot of thought to your child's name. Because let's look at Isaac. Abraham and Sarah had Isaac years, way into their old age when they were, she was past childbearing age. He was an old, old man, and bam, it happened anyway. God said it would, and it did. And Isaac means what? Laughter. Because uh, Sarah said, I have laughter in my old age. I'm going to have a baby. That's fantastic. So every day, Isaac's, Isaac's life, laughter. Time for supper. Come on home. Laughter. Get out of bed. <laughs> you know? And that, mean, that name means something. And God names things like that all through this. And I think it's a good point to bring up. So we need to think about names and what they mean. Verse 23. And He took them and sent them over the brook, His family, and sent them over that He had. <clears throat> now watch this. Because sooner or later... This is where everybody end up. It's just you and God. Now you gotta have a talk, okay? And Jacob was left alone, and there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of day. And this man that he wrestled was Almighty God Himself. He's the only man who ever fought and wrestled with God all night long. And he wouldn't quit until God Himself had to throw his hip out of joint to get him to quit. And then he wouldn't quit until he received a blessing. I won't quit unless you bless me. So, what do we ascertain from this? It's this. He wasn't a coward by any means. He was a rough and tumble guy all of his life. And yet this one thing shook him. Okay? But he's wrestling with Almighty. So he's not a coward. And maybe, now this is me, Maybe the plan he worked to get on his brother's good side, I don't know this, was a plan to protect his family. I don't know. And he certainly did not want to kill his brother. That may have been another reason. Because he may have, you know, it's him or me. But one thing is for certain, and one thing I know, he is not a coward. It's period. 25. And when he saw that he prevailed not, against him, against God, meaning the angel of the Lord. He touched the hollow of his thigh, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled him. And Jacob wrestled all night long because he was stubborn, and he was a contender. I love it. And he wouldn't quit. And Jacob's name means contender or supplanter. But he didn't prevail over God because all God did was just touch his hip and it went out of joint. God was just toying with him, okay? Not really. He's toying with him. So when it came time to stop, it wasn't any problem to stop the wrestling match. 26. And he said, This is the angel of the Lord. That's Almighty God Himself. Whether you're reading the Old or New Testament, you see the angel of the Lord, that's the Father Himself standing right there, okay? And he said, let me go. The father said, let me go. For the day breaketh. And he, Jacob, said, I will not let thee go, except thou bless me. Mm -mm -mm. So his hip is out of joint. And he's in all kinds of pain. Look at this. And he's still hanging on. He's still hanging on. So he's a tough one. 27. And he said unto him, What is thy name? Huh. And he said, Jacob. Which again means contender. And this is the way he was, even in the womb. Remember, he contended with Esau, which is why they called him heel catcher. And he was not going to let Esau be born first. It was in his nature. Then he contended with Esau for his heritage and his blessing, and he won. Okay, He contended with Laban, and he won, until he contended with God Almighty, and God won that one. Okay, But even a loser... In a wrestling match is called a what? They're called a contender. 
Remember the movie? I could have been a contender. I could have been a contender. Might have not been the champ, but I could have been a contender. Okay? So that's what he is. Verse 28. And he said, And this is the angel of the Lord, who is the Lord himself. And he said, Thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince hast thou power with God and with men, and hast prevailed. Mm -mm -mm. Now, Learn something here. Anytime you have El, E L, which means God in Hebrew, or Yah, same thing, means God, you're going to have God's name mentioned, but it is always, God is always the doer mentioned in the name. For instance, take the name Daniel. Daniel El, okay? Which means God judges, okay? But it's not Daniel doing the judging, the verb is God performing the action, always. That's what that means, okay? And God really loved Jacob. He really, really did. Or He wouldn't have changed His name to Israel. Amen? And Israel means the prince that prevailed with God. Think about that. That's amazing. Because Jacob did contend with the Almighty. <clears throat> and it is amazing to me that God would even allow this to happen, but He did. All right? And it shows God's love for Jacob. Even though he may be overprepped or whatever he did, but he loved this man and he knew what he was made out of. And this is the son, <clears throat> down line from Abraham, that will be the father of all twelve patriarchs of the nation of Israel. And I'm sure our father was very pleased with this. Verse 29. And Jacob asked him, he's asking God a question, and said, tell me, I pray thee, thy name. What's your name? And now he's asking God, hey, what's your name? And he said, wherefore is it that thou dost ask after my name? What do you want to know my name for? You want, what do you want to know my name for? And he blessed him there. And he didn't tell Jacob his name. Okay? It would be Moses later on that he would let Moses know what his sacred name is. Okay? All right, now verse 30. And Jacob called the name of the place Pinel. Okay, there's that L again. Pinel. For I, and it means, for I have seen God face to face. That means I saw him face to face. And my life is preserved. So he saw God and he lived. All right? And it is said by man, if you look at God in the face, you will die. Well, Pinel means face to face to face with L. And Jacob did see him face to face. Okay? Did you ever hear that? If man would look at God in the face, he would surely die. I heard it. But you know what I'm going to tell you? It's not true. Not only did Jacob see God's face, but so did Abraham, and so did Isaac, and so did Moses. Don't turn to it, but just listen to a handful of Scriptures out of Exodus in chapter 6 and verse 1. Then the Lord said unto Moses, Now shalt thou see what I will do to Pharaoh. For with a strong hand shall he let them go, and with a strong hand shall he drive them out of this land. And God spoke unto Moses and said unto him, I am the Lord. I am that I am. Verse 3. Now listen to what he tells Moses. And I appeared unto Abraham. I appeared unto Isaac. And I appeared unto Jacob by the name of God Almighty, but by my name Yahavah was I not known to them. Okay? So God told Moses, My name is Yahavah. That's his sacred name. All right? Now he has many titles, you know, Yahavah Nisi and all those, but his sacred name is Yahavah. So these four men looked at God face to face. But it was to Moses that God would reveal His sacred name. Listen to Jesus in John chapter 8, verse 56. Jesus told that bunch of Kenites who were falsely claiming that Abraham was their father. You remember that? And then Jesus tells them, think about this. Father Abraham, Jesus came. Melchizedek, remember? <clears throat> father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, Jesus said, and he saw it and he was glad. 
in the Hebrew language. All right? Listen to this. I am that I am is pronounced e -I, it's E-H-Y-E-H, -E if you want to write it down, Asha, A-S-H-E-R, and Ia, again, E-H-Y-E-H. -E Ia, Asha, Ia, meaning I will be or become. In other words, I will be whatever I want to be or become whatever I want to become, whenever I want, however I want, and whatever way I want it. That takes in everything. And now you know what I am that I am means. He's everything. Amen. So, <clears throat> why would God touch him in the thigh? Okay? It's because it was customary at that time that if you made a vow of the seed line of a person, this was the place that was touched. Right underneath the thigh, right here. Close to the genitals, okay? So here Jacob has had his name changed to Israel, the father of the 12 tribes of Israel, and we're into chapter 33 and verse 1. And Jacob lifted up his eyes and looked. And behold, Esau came, and with him 400 men. Da, da, da. And he divided the children unto Leah and unto Rachel and unto the two handmaidens. Now, who are these people? These are the mothers of all of Jacob's children. Okay? You remember we covered this. The children of Leah, Rachel, she had one, and, then, and the two handmaidens. And that made eleven and one daughter. We still have another son coming. Two. And he put the handmaidens and their children foremost. Okay? He put them way out in front. Alright? The concubines, they're out front. They had his kids, but they're out in front. And Leah and her children, they were after that. He sandwiched her in there, you know. Leah wasn't quite as pretty as, as, as her sister, Rachel. And Rachel and Joseph hinder most. He put them in the back, okay? And Rachel and Joseph would have been the farthest away in case there's trouble. So you can see who Jacob's favorites are. And the tension and the drama now is getting high, high, high. And I know we're not supposed to have favorites, but we do have them, don't we? Yes, we do. Verse 3. And he passed over before them, and he bowed himself to the ground seven times whew, until he came near to his brother. All right? Four. And Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him. And they wept. Now, this is not... What Jacob expected. I have been in a similar situation to this. I'm not even going to go into the story. But I thought, well, when I get to this event, there's probably going to be a fight. And, I, you know, that's just the way it's going to come down. I got there, and they couldn't have been nicer. But there was a lot of time in between. You see what I'm saying? So I understand what he's going through. Five, and he lifted up his eyes and saw the women and the children, Esau did, and said, and said who are those with thee? And he said, the children with God, hath, the children that God hath graciously given thy servant. All right, here we go. Verse six, then the handmaidens came near, they and their children, they all bowed themselves. And Leah also with her children came near and bowed themselves. And after came Joseph near and Rachel, and they bowed themselves. <clears throat> Eight, and he said, What meanest thou by all this drove which I met? What's all those cattle and sheep you're doing that I just saw? <clears throat> and he said, These are to find grace in the sight of my Lord. That's what Jacob said back to his brother. Nine, and Esau said, Well, I have enough, my brother. Keep, thou, uh, keep that that thou hast unto thyself. And because of the prophecies, now think about this, because of the prophecies <clears throat> that we covered back in Genesis chapter 25, here you have the two nations that God told Rebekah that she carried in her womb, Jacob and Esau. And those two nations to this day, I saw it on the news today, I saw Russian fighter jets zooming our American jets on the coast of Alaska. Just daring them. Those two nations to this day, one living away from the fat of the land, north of our border, and we to the south in the land of plenty, 
where the crops grow abundantly, where we're blessed, and these two nations make up the two most powerful su nuclear superpowers of the end times, Russia and the United States, okay? And Russia, right? So we're not just studying history here when we're going through Genesis. We're also able to look at the future. And again, I've said it a hundred times, you can't understand the end if you don't understand the beginning, okay? <clears throat> they go together. Ezekiel chapter 38 <clears throat> and 39 will confirm this end time interaction between the descendants of these two brothers, Jacob and Esau. So you need to take in and understand that there's nothing new under the sun. If you don't understand the beginning, again, you're not going to understand the end. It's just that simple. Now, if you want more information on Jacob and Esau, how it all ends up, this map happens to be in those lectures. I want you to go back on YouTube and listen to the lectures I did entitled The End Time Alignment of the Nations, and you'll see how it all ends up. And then you'll be able to turn your TV on and then watch it happen. So, Jacob has offered Esau presents and gifts, and Esau said, No, nah, nah, I got plenty. I got plenty. Verse 10. And Jacob said, No, 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 no. I pray thee, if, thou, if now I have found grace in your sight, then receive my present at my hand, and therefore I have seen thy face as though I had seen the face of God, and thou wast pleased with me. So Jake is relieved here based on his brother's reception. Verse 11. Take, I pray thee, my blessing that is brought to thee because God hath dealt graciously with me and because I have enough. And he urged him and he took it. All right? He took all the, the present. And I'm sure, I'm quite sure, that he needed it. You know why? Because remember, he sold the birthright and he didn't get the blessing. He, he needed it because he didn't have the blessings of God. He didn't even respect God. So yeah, he needed it and his brother knew it. Verse 12, And Esau said, Let us take our journey. Okay, he got the goodies. Let's go back home and let us go, and I will go before thee. And Jacob said unto him, My Lord knoweth that the children are tender in my group, and the flocks and the herds with young are with me. And if I should overdrive them one day, all the flock will die. In other words, I've got my little children with me, and I've got my livestock has the, the very young We've got to take it easy, bro, to get to, to, to get to your place. 14. Let my Lord, I pray thee, pass over before his servant, and I will lead on softly. In other words, just get out of here and I'll follow you up there. You know, I'll lead on softly according as the cattle that goeth before me and the children be able to endure until I come unto my Lord unto Seir. Or it should, could even say Mount Seir. Verse 15. And Esau said, Let me now leave, with, leave thee with some of the folks <clears throat> that are with me. In other words, let me leave a couple of hundred of my soldiers with you. How's that? And Jacob said, No, who needeth it? Okay, question. We're doing great. We don't need any help. Let me find grace in the sight of my Lord. So you can see, old Jake is still a little nervous over these 400 soldiers. <clears throat> 16. So Esau returned that day on his way unto Seir. That's where uh, Esau lives. And Jacob journeyed to Succoth. And you know what Succoth means? Succoth means booths or huts from which we have the Feast of Booths or the Feast of Tabernacles uh, at, at Tabernacles time and built him a an house and made booths for his cattle. Therefore the name of the place is called Succoth. Okay? You don't have to be a brain surgeon to figure it out. That's why you want to name your kid what you want him to be. All right, <clears throat> 18. <clears throat> and Jacob came to Shalem. I used to have Shalom and Shalem, but I changed it to Shalom and Shalah. Shalom and Shalem means, she means peace and safety. Shalom and Shalah means peace and prosperity. And I like that one better. So <clears throat> Jacob came to Shalem, which means safe, a city of Sechem, which is in the land of Canaan, which he came from Pandanaram, and pitched his tent before the city. Now he's back in Canaan. Canaan's got a lot of bad people living in it. Part of that second influx of the Nephilim already there. They were in the land. 
fallen angels, and there's already giants running around. Okay? So there's lots of problems here. 19. And he brought a parcel of land where he had spread his tent at the hand of the children of Hamar, Sechem's father, for an hundred pieces of money. All right? 20. And he erected there an altar and called it El El Ohi Israel. El El Ohi Israel, which means God, the God of Israel. That's what it means. So now he's come back to the land God promised to Abraham. And what is the first thing he does? It's real smart. He secures a piece of property in a land where there are people who certainly do not follow God. And the first thing he does is he builds an altar. An altar is a place of thanksgiving, okay, for our Father. And that's very important. Always remember to put God first place in your life. That brings forth the blessings, all right? Don't ever take credit for the things that God does. For instance, if you have a gift, don't take credit for it yourself. No, 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 no. It belongs to God. He gave it, and it's still His. You get to use it. That's great. But don't ever forget to thank Him for it, okay? For allowing you the privilege of using that gift. So, Genesis 32, a little bit of 31 and 33, are two very powerful and insightful chapters, I think. And I suppose the biggest takeaway for me is this. I'm going to repeat it. Don't ever doubt God. Whenever God makes it clear and you have decided, hey, let's go for it, okay? Whatever it is, which means you've already done your homework on your end, you've already got all your ducks in a row, and if that's the case, then you go for it with energy, strength, and vigor. And you don't go with any ifs, and you don't go with any ands, and you don't go with any buts. If God has blessed you in a certain thing, and God makes it clear to you that something will succeed, again, it always does, never fails. And there is no negative that can stop you. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you enjoyed that those two chapters. But I'm going to tell you something. We need these same blessings upon us today. We need them right now. The same ones that God gave to Jacob in order to face what's coming up in these end times. We need it. In order to get and in order to get that kind of counseling, that kind of protection, that kind of provision like Jacob got from God. There are certain things that you must do in order to qualify for what I call the Jacob blessing. And those qualifications are very clearly laid out in the Word of God. That's why in our upcoming Dove Point Fall Fellowship, I'll be bringing you an end-time prophetic message entitled, The Feast of Tabernacles Prophecy and Blessing, Will You Qualify? Will You Qualify? And I'll be talking about God, our Father, the Avenger, the one who carries out justice on our behalf, His children, especially for those of us living in this end time. It's going to be a powerful message. It is a powerful message. And it's one that needs to come forth. And for all those who would like to attend our Dove Point Fellowship, Fall Fellowship, the meeting will be held, I'm going to go real slow, Sunday, October 20th at 10 a.m. And just for the sake of the... Uh, uh, YouTube 2024 okay because somebody might be watching this a year from now <clears throat> it will be held at the Miners Day Inn Miners Day I'm sorry Miners Day Building King Jack Park Web City Mo Missouri 64870 one more time the meeting will be held on Sunday October the 20th 10 p or 10 a.m. at the Miners Day Building King Jack Park Web City, Missouri, 64870. And I'm sure I've got you confused, but not really. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> now, if you can possibly make it to this meeting, I promise you, Father God will be in the house. He will be there. His presence will be there, and it will be stout. So come if you possibly can, and come expecting a prophetic word 
from our Father that will greatly, greatly help you. Also, at the end of the lecture, we'll be taking communion together. So for those of you who can't make it at home, uh, Ralph, will you put it out the same day, you think? The lecture on the Sunday? Possibility? Yeah, yeah. So have your sacraments ready, okay? And you can take communion with us while you watch the video. And if you'd like to write us, you know, we'd love to hear from you what the Lord's doing in your life. And if you would, tell a friend about Dove Point and hit that subscribe button and like for us, okay? Won't you do that? That helps us. We're trying to get over that 1,000 mark and we're so close. If you'd hit it, we'll get it, okay? Also, just so you know, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, which is the day, which is a day of fasting and prayer, begins October the 11th at sundown, okay? And don't miss the next lecture. I'll be bringing you a lecture on all seven of the Lord's feast days. So if you know anyone who wants to learn about the Lord's feast days, be sure and tell them about this up and coming lecture. It'll be the last one I do before fellowship, fall fellowship. So, from all of us here at Dove Point, we thank you all for watching. Until next time, my friends, you know, Shalom and Shalom.